Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to what I can offer you as a master coach. I can help you to focus on your why with clarity, uniting your passion with your purpose with a plan to create the life you truly desire. Book a free 20-minute coaching call right now via calendly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson forward slash call and we can take it from there. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Andy Lapata. Andy, a very warm welcome. Thank you, Amy. Well, it's been a long time coming. We've been planning this for months and finally you are here in the Focus and Why environment and I'm very excited. Yes, it has been a while, hasn't it? But we got there in the end. Well, we're very busy people. That's the way things happen. It's always a good sign. It is. It is. So, Andy, tell us, what is, what is it that you are busy with right now? <laughs> it's, it's, someone asked me this the other day and I didn't know quite where to start. I, I'm enjoying a very uh, good period, which is is lovely because it's not always like that. You know, I'm not going to sit here and pretend otherwise. But live events are back. Uh, so suddenly I've gone from two and a half years without travel to three overseas trips in in five weeks. And, and, and it's nice to get back into conferences. And most of the conferences I'm speaking at, uh, the talks are all on uh, my talks around professional relationships from one for, in one form or another. Uh, what's quite funny is uh, my first talks back this year in person. So we had a couple of things at the end of last year, um, when you know before the Christmas lockdown. My first ones back this year, about six or eight weeks ago, I couldn't fit into my suit. Um, I I slipped a disc um, during lockdown, and it really impacted my uh, exercise routine. Um, so I actually couldn't get into any of my suit trousers. So what I'm really proud of is I can get into my suit trousers now, stone and a quarter in, in a month or, or about six weeks. So uh, that that was really good. Um, but, yeah, uh, people are bringing me out, and, and the, the talk on professional relationships is relevant in a number of different ways, but one of the key things is getting people back to getting into the habit of engaging with human beings face to face again and building those relationships. So a lot of my events are internal within organizations and they want to get their teams talking to each other again and building relationships. And what what really stands out for me uh, more so than ever is that in a number of my recent events, the, the content has been important, but the connection has been vital. And the brief has been, I want them to have fun. Um, so that's been great because obviously I've enjoyed myself doing that. So that's been key. I've also been doing a lot of associate work, which I haven't historically done, but I'm working with other 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 uh, delivery organizations. A lot of that is focused on LinkedIn and helping people build relationships on LinkedIn. So that's been uh, producing a lot for me as well. And I, I've got a new blog on psychology today, um, which is uh, I'm really proud of. So I'm starting to write regular blogs for psychology today as well. We published uh, the first blog a few weeks ago, uh, just towards the tail end of May, um, and I'm aiming to 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 write there every every fortnight or so. Um, so a lot happening there, plus all my normal delivery, the the my own podcast. Um, we, we've been digging into what we call connected leadership gold for a few weeks because I've been so so full on. It's been struggling to get interviews um, scheduled, including this one, obviously going the other way. Um, but um, I'm back into uh, some really interesting interviews. The morning that we're recording this, I had a fascinating uh, and very provocative interview um, with two guys with with very powerful backgrounds, former rugby league international and a former New Zealand army guy and close protection officer, all about um, uh, male tox- masculine toxicity and, and so forth. So quite a, a, an immersive uh, return and a provocative return. So in short, there's a lot going on. Absolutely. And it sounds fascinating. And 
there are a lot of people out there who are thinking, well, I didn't have a slip disc and I'd certainly put on a stone in lockdown. <laughs> so at least you had an excuse there. Yeah. But tell me more about the, the the relationship that you have between connection and fun. Yeah, it's it's interesting because as a speaker, and you'll know this, you can you can give the best content in the world, but if you don't engage your audience, then they're not going to take it on board. So you always want to have some fun with your audience anyway, and you want to get them involved. Even if you don't have time to get them proactively involved, you want to draw them into your presentation and you want them to enjoy the experience. Uh, but it, it's it, it's not new, but as I intimated, it's more it's a clearer priority for clients that, yes, they want the content to be a fit for their objectives, um, but more important to them has been uh, we want – one of my clients put it this way. He said, whenever we get the feedback forms, he said, we put so much time and effort into finding the right agenda for the program. But then we get the feedback form. We ask, what was your your standout moment of the conference? And it's never the keynote talk. It's never the content. It's always – uh, the networking, it's the connecting with my colleagues. And he said, that's what we want. We, it's been three years, and this has been a theme. It's been three years since we all got back, we all got together. And and what I'm seeing, separate to what clients are telling me, is that a lot of people are new to the organisation in that time as well. So for them, it's their first time getting together with their colleagues. Uh, and they may have been in the organisation for two years or more. Um, and they want them to enjoy that. So uh, what we did in, in, in um, I was in Portugal about three or four weeks ago. I'm in uh, Barcelona next week. Um, and in both cases, we're kicking off with a snowball fight with uh, Jackie Barry. I don't know if Jackie's been on your podcast, but Jackie, I'm sure she has. Um, but Jackie, he, he, I know, is a good friend of yours as well as mine. It was a Jackie Barry idea back when we worked together. She was... Um, uh, an area partner for me when I ran networking groups way back uh, 20 years ago uh, and she came up with this concept of snowball fights and we get people to write into a sheet of paper scrunch it up throw it around the room I had 300 people in Portugal throwing bits of paper at each other it looked amazing they were laughing and joking the content of that piece of paper is something pe people don't know about you we got them to read it out and we just kicked off with fun I lost complete control of the room uh, and I knew that I probably would, and the client was fine with that, which is important. But that was more important than the content in a lot of ways because we broke down barriers, and, and it aids the learning process as well because it, it, it tells the audience that they're not going to sit there and just be lectured to and, and suffer death by PowerPoint. So you talk about professional relationships. That's what your sort of your broad yeah. area is. But if you had to take it down to one word what is the theme of everything you do <laughs> you're trying to distill me down from two words to one word <laughs> um and i'm not going to the word that you might think um so my 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 you know what i've known for is networking and you know the sun many years ago called me mr network and and, and the financial times and and other national uh newspapers have have praised me around my work on networking over the years it is networking the reason I don't use that term is because it's misunderstood so it's networking as I see it but not networking as too many people see it so too many people see networking as uh, exchanging business cards and elevator pitches over cold canapes and warm wine and it sends a shiver down the spine people hate it uh, and that's not what I teach. Can I teach a group of people how to work a room, uh, as Suzanne Rowan coined it? Y yes, I can. Um, is that what I do? Very rarely now. Um, I teach people how to build a network. I teach people how to build, nurture and leverage that network. Uh, and it's the professional relationships within that network that we, we focus on. So, no, I'm not going to say networking. <laughs> And do you know what? I didn't think that would be the word either. Okay. Because for me, professional relationships is the term. Yeah. And if you have an alternative, I would love to know it. But for me, that's my umbrella term. I just had connection down. Okay. Yeah. I, I think, okay, I use connection a lot in my work. My business strapline is connecting is not enough. Uh, 
Mm. And I think that I wouldn't use connection um, as an overall term because, again, it can be misunderstood. People connect on LinkedIn, but they don't necessarily converse on LinkedIn. I'm interested in the conversation, not the connection. The connection is merely a point in the process and the connection leads to a relationship. And that's more important because if you look at your LinkedIn network and it's a mix of people, you know, really well uh, and people who click connect and you click accept and you never have a conversation. Who do you think is going to be there for you when you need you, when you need something? And then who do you think you'll be there for and be comfortable supporting genuinely, authentically? Um, when they need something it's the people where you've got a relationship so connection is just part of the process uh, and, and that term that word connection can have so many meanings within the process because it can be the act of connecting it can be establishing a meaningful connection um, it can be reconnecting it can be connecting other people so it has so many different uses within the process but for me it's professional relationships and um- I use the word connectedness, which is, again, slightly different. And and it's all about the way that I use the podcast to help connect people, because I believe that we're all different pieces of a very big jigsaw in this world. And it's about building a better world, about building a better life individually, but also collectively. So I wanted to ask you more about the, the psychology elements. Have you got a background in psychology? No, I, I don't. And uh, I know psychology today would suggest that I would, but it's not just psychologists that write for it. It's about human behaviour. And obviously the work that I do is linked to human behaviour. I did study social psychology as a module at university, and it was probably one of the ones that really caught my attention. But my lack of any scientific ability uh, academically when I was younger precluded me doing anything deeper than that. So, Andy, tell me a bit more about the purpose piece, how purpose fits into everything you're doing. Uh, I guess where I would come from for me, there's two ways I could answer that. I could look at my purpose, which would fit with the the purpose of the podcast. Um, But actually, I would start from other people's purpose, because I think the networking activity, the building of professional relationships, uh, activity on LinkedIn, going to networking events, if you want to distill it down to that level, uh, too often are committed without purpose. So we we know if, for example, if you're in a sales role or run your own business, which means you're in a sales role, uh, you'll know, depending on the industry you're in, but in, in the majority of industries, the most effective form of new business generation is word of mouth. It's recommendation and referral. Um, and yet we invest more time, more effort, more resource, more, more money into almost any other route to market. And we leave word of mouth to chance. If I do a good job, people will refer me, which isn't the way the world works, but it's the way we want the world to work. So we think that that's enough. Uh, people go to a networking event because they're told to. They, they join LinkedIn because everyone's doing it and suggest it. But they don't think, why am I there? Uh, and I think we need purpose in that activity. If it's going to be, if it's going to underpin our success, I, I'm a great believer that professional relationships, strong professional relationships, underpin the success of anything you want to do. Uh, whether it's to uh, drive more sales, whether it's to get uh, find the solution to your challenges more quickly, uh, whether it's to get promotion, to find a new job, whatever it is you can look at almost anything and say that is going to be easier if you tap into other people's experience, expertise, ideas, worldview, whatever it might be. Um, And the people that are going to help you are the ones that are going to want to help you are predominantly the ones that you've got the strongest relationships with. There are, there are outliers liars to that. There's a law called Granovetta's law. Um, a, a, a sociologist, Mark Granovetta, looked at the power of weak ties, so people you don't know that well in the recruitment process. And he, he pointed out how people who you're not close to have different networks to you by their very nature, and therefore they can open more doors. Um, but I would still argue that while you need to be aware of that, it's the the strong relationships that will introduce you to the weaker ties who will open those doors for you. Um, 
so we whatever we're trying to achieve we can do it more easily with other people's support so let's have some purpose behind that and that to me would be my number one uh response to to, to your question i guess my own purpose would be a completely different answer and what would that be <laughs> I, I guess that then comes down to why do you do what you do? Or why do I do what I do and what drives you? Uh, it, it's really interesting. The podcast interview I recorded this morning, um, one of the guys, Luke Ambler, um, who, who runs this amazing organization called Andy's Man Club, not named after me, I, I, I stress. Um, but Andy's Man Club is a is groups of men around the UK who meet to talk. And it gives men a platform to open up and be vulnerable with each other. And it's it's because of his brother-in-law, Andy, who committed suicide and, and didn't tell anyone and didn't open up. And uh, Luke said right at the end of, uh, of our conversation, he said that within Andy's man club, within the, the team there, the staff there, he said people in any organisation uh, have an obsession with hierarchies and titles and we always want to impress our boss we always want to impress the person above us and luke's point was don't worry about impressing me as the chief executive don't worry about impressing the people above you in the organization look at that that letter you got from a father who said that he could take his son to to a football game for the first time because of what you achieved look at the the, the gratitude that's come in from people who have been in through the process and that was really powerful for me um, um, I don't know if we're using video on, on this at all, but for people who are listening on the podcast, behind me are thank you cards. I have a wall full of thank you cards. You can't even see all of them uh, in the shot. Um, and, and some of those date back over 20 years. I, I'd never throw away a thank you card. And I think the 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 impression, the impact that I make on other people is the why for me. I could have earned a lot more money if I'd have followed a corporate career. I'm not wealthy. You know, I, I, I'll never pretend to be so. I, I live a life I absolutely love. I work really hard for it, and I am blessed in some of the things that I get to do. Travel around the world with my work, speak in some amazing locations, get treated like royalty in some countries. Uh, and I, I'll never lose sight of how lucky I am because I just happen to have found a career which is right for me, in which I do well. And there aren't that many people doing it in the world, which helps me rise a lot higher than if I was trying to be the world's best accountant, for example. Um, so I, I'm very lucky in that. Um, and, and I enjoy all of that. But that's not why I do it. Why I do it is the email I got after a talk last month from a financial advisor who said, I've been in this industry for 30 years. And I've never heard anyone express these principles it, with, with, with such simplicity and clarity as you did. And he said when he moved area, he, he, he struggled in certain ways with his relationships, particularly leveraging them effectively and getting the help and support he needed. And the, what I shared has given him the answers to, that he needed and he can now do that. It, it's, the, it's the actress who wrote to me after my second book came out and death came third. I never wrote it for actors and actresses. Um, I never considered it, but she wrote to both me and my co-author, Peter Roper. And she said that she had a flatmate who um, always got acting jobs, never had to audition. And yet she couldn't even get auditions. Uh, and so that book had helped her understand how she could build a network and how she could go out there to get the auditions that she needed to, to get on the ladder. That might, I mean, that that might, that's 10 years ago. No, it's 15 years ago. It's 2006, more, 16 years ago. So um, that I still remember. I, you know, it's that. That's why I do what I do. It's the impact that it has on people. And it, it just, it moves me every time someone takes the, 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 makes the effort to say, thank you so much. What you, what you did really helped me. As a speaker, you'll know that a lot of events, people fill in feedback forms. And I mentioned my client said they do their feedback form and people always never say the keynote. At that event, five people uh, of the early respondents said their highlight of the conference was my talk. And my client was going, I'm sorry, it's only five. I said, five's wonderful because you said no one does. And actually the, the, the overall feedback for my talk was very, very high. But that's what we call happy sheets. It's a short-term 
um, adrenaline shot. It gives you an indication that people enjoyed what you did and valued it in the moment. But if that, that, those numbers, so, so it was 75% of the first 100 or so people that, that responded. So let's say it's 75 people. If those 75 people really enjoyed what I delivered but do nothing ever with it, what was the point? What was the purpose? So actually, if one of them, two of them, five of them write to me in, in two years and say, I changed the way I approach building relationships because of your talk, and as a result, this happened, those one, two or five emails would mean more than the 75 that have said that was a great talk. And do you, have you heard of the love languages, Andy? I have. Would I, would, I wouldn't profess to be an expert in it, but, but no, I've come well, across the phrase, yeah. So Dr. Gary Chapman uh, identified five different love languages, and one of them is words of affirmation. Yeah. So essentially, that is what serves you, and that's what gives you love in the world. That's how you give and receive love through your words. So you, and that's why you treasure your cards so much, maybe. Yes, I, 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 th I think there's something there. I'd, I'd need to know more what's behind there in order to comment in more depth. Um, I think a lot of it, it is, it's about having meaning in the world. It's, a, you know, it's an oft used term, but it's about legacy mm. and having meaning. I don't have kids and I'm at an age where I wouldn't write it off, but it's increasingly unlikely. I don't, I won't leave a legacy that way. I have to leave a legacy somewhere else. And we all want our life to have some meaning. And if my life can have meaning through my work, and, and I, I, without being arrogant about it, I believe it has, based on the feedback I've had over the years. Um, I had lunch with um, someone who came to one of my talks many years ago when she worked at Aviva Investors. And it's quite funny because I wouldn't call, I did three workshops for Aviva Investors in one day. I wouldn't call them a success by any means, but two people who came there are still regularly in touch with me. And this particular person, she's brought me into other jobs she's got into. And I've worked over the world through, through her recommendation. Um, I actually got her her last job um, with one of my clients. Um, but we sat down for lunch and she said, I've used everything you te taught me in that first session every day since. And it's well over a decade ago. Um, and you, you know, that goes back to the happy sheet. Uh, concept because th they weren't a, a long-lasting success those programs for most of the people in there but that's there's two people I know for a fact who really valued them and have applied them is that a success I, I think it probably is certainly in, in in those terms and over the time that you've been working Andy have you seen an evolution in the the way that people are networking the way that relationships are being built well, well uh, naturally I have because when I got involved in networking 23 years ago, I had never even heard the word before. And most people, many people hadn't. It wasn't a common part of our language. Um, I think there have been a few landmarks on the journey. Um, so in 2007, I went to... Um, I went to a couple of women's networking events in the corporate space in short, a short gap between them, um, around 2007, 2008. So the first one, I was leaving my business, the networking groups that, that, I, that got me into that space in the first time. And I knew I wanted, wanted to move into the corporate space. And I needed to understand the role of networking in, in a corporate environment. And I'd been invited along to Women in Technology because I've done a lot of work with women's networks over the years. There were 200 women, well, there were 200 people there, 199 women and me. Um, and it's quite funny because they had a number of speakers and the speakers were all in a panel at the end. And I did one of the bravest things I've done in my life. And I've rap jumped and I've abseiled and I've done various things. I asked a question in this room of the panel and I apologised first for not being a woman and second for not being in technology. But then I, I, I said, how different is it for a woman to network in a corporate environment to a man? And one by one, each of those speakers shot me down. We don't network. We don't do that. We don't have time to do that. We don't play games. It was so negative. A few months later, I went to a European Professional Women's Network event. They'd originally invited me to speak. Then someone offered to do it for nothing. Uh, but they invited me along anyway. Um, and um, I listened to one of the speakers, and, and, and she said, 
how many people in this room think networking is important for their career? And almost every hand went up in the room. So in a, less than a year, it went from being shot down for mentioning networking to almost unanimous agreement it was important. What happened between then, 2007, 2008? The crash. And people suddenly realised that they needed to network um, because their jobs were at stake. Uh, I haven't seen any stats on it, but from my observation is that there was a huge spike in LinkedIn usage uh, and proactivity on LinkedIn in around 2008. Uh, I certainly, I was on LinkedIn from, I've been on LinkedIn since about 2005. In 2008, I saw suddenly a lot more people on it and more people active on it. Why? Their jobs were at stake. So I think that was a sea change in the way networking has been perceived, and then it's gradually changed since then. So we are in a space now where people are more positive about networking, even though I still feel there's a lot of misunderstanding of the term. Um, I think we still see too much uh, bad, um, bad, too many bad examples set, too much bad practice out there. Great examples would be people who just connect with anyone on LinkedIn. Click connect, basic message. We don't know each other. It doesn't matter. I want to grow my network. When you ask why they want to connect, they reply with, I want to do this. I want to do that. They make it about themselves. You see too many, if you go to events, people whizzing around giving out business cards, people preparing their elevator pitches, not connecting on a human level, but just going you know, through the motions. You see people who are taught... If you want to succeed through networking, you've got to help other people first. So you meet a complete stranger and they say, how can I help you? Well, I haven't met you yet. Let's get to know each other first. So there's too much short termism from both giving and receiving perspective. Um, so that's still there. But I am seeing a general improvement and I'm seeing more accept acceptance and understanding of it at a more nuanced level, a more relationship level. And you, you describe it as professional relationships, but how much of the personal side is important? How much of bringing that side into things? It, it, I think it's hugely important because we connect on a human level. Uh, Phil Calvert, who does a lot of great work in this space, um, in the financial advisor space, uh, particularly in life planning. Um, Phil did a LinkedIn talk for the Professional Speaking Association once, and he said, remember, it's a social network. Even though it's a professional network, it's a social network and it's people to people. And I really fight this when I'm doing the LinkedIn training and I'm working with people in corporates. A lot of them are engineering background or technical backgrounds. Um, I hear every single session, uh, even though I'm not I don't cover posting until our second session. They want to get out in the first session. It's not Facebook. And then I point out that the posts that get the most engagement have an element of the personal in them now you can get the balance so i interviewed uh, phil jones who's one of the top ceos in this country in terms of social he's, he's the ceo md of brother uk phil um uh, i interviewed phil on my podcast a, a few weeks ago and phil said he 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 never promotes or hardly ever promotes brother products through his posts he he, he posted when he they took they got a new dog but then he span it to his leadership lessons from getting a new dog. Now, I don't think personally you need to do that. Sometimes you can put a little personal twist in. I always share the example of during one of the early lockdowns, I posted a picture of a bright, I've got some really brightly colored chopping boards. I love cooking. And, and I took a picture of this chopping board with a pile of garlic, a pile of ginger, a pile of chilies and a pile of chicken thighs. And I, I just said, one of the advantages of lockdown is you don't have to check your diary for who you're meeting the next morning before you cook a curry. That got huge engagement. I'm showing what I love. I'm showing a bit of humor. And I'm engaging on commonality. If you like a curry, if you like cooking, if you just like my sense of humor, you'll engage with that. Um, and I think that's really important because then that draws you into other things. And whether it's on LinkedIn, whether it's in person, we connect on that human level. The amount of my clients who talk to me about football, because when they find out I'm a football fan, they find out who I support. That's what they raise with me. Um, and, and if they don't like football, they don't talk about it with me. It's absolutely fine. There's a story I tell in, in, in my professional relationships talk. And it's a shame I can't share it with you visually because it's a very, very visual story. But the short version is that I delivered a session for a senior leadership retreat for a big private equity house. 
and I had dinner with the team afterwards. I sat down to, to, with, with the managing director for London for them. We got on really well. He invited me to run a session for his team. It was a complete and absolute car crash. Biggest disaster of any session I've ever run in my life. I'm worried there's a theme coming on here. Not all my sessions are disasters. I just learned from them or I just acknowledge them. Um, but anyway, w- w- that was a car crash, but we stayed in touch. And he, uh, over the course of time, he's become my mentor. He's referred me. He's rebooked me. He's used me again. And and I always ask my audiences, well, how can I have a car crash uh, of a program? But that person doesn't just rebook me, but refers me and mentors me. And that relationship continues. And it goes back to that dinner after the event, because although we did talk about my presentation and we did talk about how I could work with his team, the majority of our conversation was about football because that's what we had in common. And he invited me to Wembley for the FA Cup semi-final a couple of weeks later. He's an Aston Villa fan. And he said, meet me in the Chinese restaurant on the Wembley Stadium estate. So at two o'clock, I go into this Chinese restaurant and I'm looking for the city banker in the pinstripe suit. And I can't find him. And this is the point in the presentation I bring up the picture of who I did see. And he's wearing an Aston Villa claret and blue shirt and a claret and blue bubble perm wig. And the point I make is that we connected on a human level and he allows his human side to come out. He doesn't conform to stereotype of the city banker. And that's how you create a real long-standing, long-lasting connection, which we've still got many years later. So if you can find that commonality, if you can introduce some vulnerability in the relationship as well, uh, because that really creates engagement, if you can be yourself, people will be drawn to you. And I, uh, I have a very simple philosophy. I try not to be anybody in any area of my life that would embarrass me in another area of my life. And that gives me full license to be myself wherever I am. And if you don't like that, then that's absolutely fine. I'm not going to please everyone. But I do think it has endeared me to more people than maybe than when I was wearing more of a mask. And it was exactly that, that the facade that people put up in, in the environment. And you, you said you're predominantly working in the corporate environment. Now, I haven't been in the corporate environment for a while mm. now. I've been out of it. But... I, I do remember that there was definitely this facade that you would hold. And then after a couple of drinks, networking or out after work, that would all drop. And that's when all the relationships are built. And I'm not advocating that you, everyone needs to have a few drinks before. That's not the case. But the case is that there is a level of vulnerability that if you bring that to the table and that authenticity piece, that's what makes a difference. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure you've mentioned the PSA, Professional Speaking Association, on the podcast before, and, and, and we've referenced it earlier. I remember when I first joined the PSA, and you had these legends of the PSA who were the, the big speakers that everyone looked up to. They didn't know who the hell I was. And I remember one of my earliest conventions. I was among the last five to bed at four o'clock in the morning. Now, four o'clock is quite tame these days with a BSA convention, but back then I was among the last five to bed. I should say I was the only one of those five to be at the first talk the next morning, by the way. Um, But that broke huge barriers. And and the other four were all very well-established, very well-renowned speakers who knew each other well. But, you know, once we'd spent that time together, they... um, I became one of them, you know, in terms of there was no, you know, we were friends. And one of them who's sadly no longer with us, um, but was a phenomenally successful speaker, he would phone me up and ask my advice and he'd phone up and share with me. And it was, it wasn't because he valued me as a speaker, although I'd like, I don't know if he ever saw me speak, to be honest, but it was because we, we, the barriers came down um, once it's four o'clock in the morning and you're having fun. And I don't drink that much now, so maybe I miss out on that a little bit. But then I, I, I perhaps put, partook a little bit more than I do now. And it, it does bring down barriers. It's sad that alcohol is a key part of that. It is hard to do it when you either don't drink much or, or certainly I try not to drink in a professional environment. Um, so I, I was at gala dinner at the conference in Portugal and I drank water all night, which was difficult. Everyone else was letting their hair down, but it was their party, not mine. So it does make it more difficult, but you, I still created a great relationship with the people I was on the table with and, and a few people I spoke to that evening. It didn't get in the way that much. And it's interesting you said that you became one of them. 
I just wanted to sort of ask what that means in terms of did you see it as a, a me and them and then you were allowed in this is, comes back to connectedness and the connection again yeah I, I i did and i think people still do when i was on the board of the psa and i was president of the fellows community we got a lot of criticism um about it being a clique and i'm very defensive about that because i don't know a warmer and more welcoming community i think that not everyone but the vast majority of experienced speakers and that's, they're not all fellows by the way uh, the experienced speakers but the vast majority of long-term members and experienced speakers are very open to new members and very supportive of new members. Fact is, you see your mates once a year at convention, you want to be speaking to them. You don't exclude others, but you're going to make a beeline for your friends. I will do exactly the same because, you know, that's what I want to go to put to convention for. Um, but some people will see that as cliquey, and I would have seen that as cliquey when I joined. So I, 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 I think it probably wasn't too different then to, 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 to now. Uh, and perhaps it was more perception than reality. Maybe it was more cliquey then. I don't think it was. I think it's always been a very open, supportive community. Um, I think there's an element of it in any community where people, you need to prove yourself in some form. So if you're new, people are going to judge you on what you say. They're going to want to know if you're a great speaker. They're going to uh, want to know who vouches for you, um, that they trust. That's natural human nature. Um, there's nothing about our community that's like that. And it would have been exactly the same at the conference I was at in Portugal, where there were people who had been franchisees of my client for 20 years. And they're gonna, they've not seen each other for three years. And there were people there who were assessing whether to join the franchise. I think everyone was made welcome. I was certainly made welcome, and I was from outside that community. Um, but that doesn't mean that people didn't want to see their friends. So I, I, I get invited to a lot of awards do's and gala dinners when I'm speaking. And although I teach networking um, and, and, you know, that type of event is part of that, very often I don't turn up for the drinks reception at the beginning because if I'm outside that community, people don't want to talk to me. They want to catch up with their friends. They don't want me working the room. It's not appropriate in that environment. I'll wait till the dinner and I'll go and join people then uh, because I'm just elbowing my way in to their catch up with their friends and I think you just have to recognize that and it's a really good point because it's about investing your time your energy and your effort into building these relationships and the rewards are such as you described the fabulous connection that you then get over time and that yeah. that is something that you know is really rewarding to be able to see someone who you haven't seen for a long time and then get together with them again so i i totally understand and from the outside it could look as though it's a clique but it's it's not it's just people who have known each other and experienced similar situations and been together and had experiences that they've had a great time in in an environment so and I can see that having been in the PSA now for a couple of years there have been many a late night zoom call and as a result of that we've got stories that we can share totally and can I share one story Please. Um, and I, 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 I it might predate you joining so I don't know if you know this um, but you'll know the person. So uh, it, it was a PSA convention. I think it may have been 2016. And a, a video was posted on the PSA Facebook group um, by an American speaker called Julie Holmes, who just moved to the UK. None of us had met Julie. And Julie, um, as well as being a phenomenal speaker on sales and an inventor of great products, she trains Vizslers. So she has these amazing performing dogs. And she had this wonderful uh, dog who's, who sadly passed away. Uh, I think it was Echo. And the video, our introduction to Julie, was a video of her saying, hi, everyone. Um, I, I've just come to the UK. I've just joined the PSA. I'm looking forward to meeting you all at convention. And she had an open suitcase behind her. And I think if it was Echo, the dog walked in and got in the suitcase and then zipped it. If I remember right, he zipped it around himself. It was just brilliant. And, and then, of course, everyone wanted to know this, this, this woman. So sometimes, OK, don't go and train a dog just to get into a clique. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes you've got to make the effort. You've got to make the running. And you make the running by not looking at a group of friends um, talking and saying, I can't join them, but read the body language, read the room, but then find someone who, who um, is, is established 
get to know them, talk to them, get them to introduce you to someone else and introduce you to someone else, and you'll find yourself part of it. But don't expect people to throw a lasso around you and pull you in. You've got to do some of the work yourself, and then you want the group to be receptive to that, which with Julie, everyone absolutely was. And, and I'm not going to name other people, but you could easily, we could sit down and have a conversation and we could name names of people that have gone from zero to fully integrated uh, with all of the long-term members in five minutes. And we could name people that have been around for ages, but no one really knows anything about them because they don't make that effort. Yeah, well, a couple of things. I also train dogs, but I'm a spaniel, springer spaniel trainer. <laughs> so I need to get those videos out into the into yeah. our Facebook groups for sure, because there'll be some very funny stories there. But also I'm with you. I integrated myself into the PSA because I saw the benefits of all the people who were there. And it is a really good relationship. It's a two-way relationship. And uh, I give as much as I get from it for, for sure. Andy, it's been a pleasure talking to you about professional relationships, talking to you about networking, connecting, connection, connectedness, all the different connection, <laughs> connected <laughs> words that we can think of. How would people get in contact with you? How would they connect with you, Andy? Um, I think the best way is to go to my link tree page. Um, so it's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E forward slash Andy Lapata. That will ha has links to my books, my podcasts, my social media um, profiles uh, and so forth. I must put my Psychology Today blog on there now that that's new. Um, that's what I'll do straight after this. So by the time this is out, you shoot me if it's not there. Well, maybe <laughs> not shoot me, but, but tell me off. So the link tree would be the best approach. Um, I don't have a wholly open connection strategy on LinkedIn. So please don't just click connect and accept, expect me to click accept. Send me a personal message or just follow me there if, if my posts uh, are of interest and then engage with me through the conversation. Let's work towards where it's appropriate to connect. But I'm always open to engagement. And if people message me, if they uh, comment on my posts and so forth, I always seek to respond because I think that's really important. Well, thank you. And thank you for sharing why you do what you do. It's been a pleasure having this conversation. Have you got some final words, Andy, for the audience, please? Yeah, let's go back to um, that conversation about breaking into the cliques, so to speak. Way back in 1999, 2000, at one of the breakfast groups we ran, uh, and I know the year because one of the members called Peter Baxter Derrington gave a talk about equipping yourself for the new millennium. And he, 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 he shared a comment that was part of one of my early talks, became one part of one of my early talks, and is in uh, that second book, Death Came Third, where he said, pursue the relationship, not the sale. And I think that's really important. It's that long-term thinking. I think, I, I said earlier, there's too much short-term thinking in the world. There's too many tactics, not enough strategy. Uh, and, and I think my final word is see relationships over the long term. I get referrals. I get support. I get bookings. I get um, just great conversations from people I met 20 years ago. Uh, and you don't need to get something from everyone straight away. You don't even have to get something from everyone you meet. Some people you'll give to, some people you'll get help from, and some people you'll just enjoy the pleasure of getting to know them and just enjoy that journey. How has this conversation had an impact on you? What value have you received from tuning in? What are your reflections with actions? Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.